again for a second or two. So this has got a bit of sound, doesn't make much of a difference. Yeah, that's Ed there eating his biscuits, fat Jaffa. <laughs> okay, so hey everybody, this is the uh, movie uh, conversation that Ed and I have. Uh, welcome back. Um, tonight we thought we would watch and chat about Aliens. So this is obviously the sequel to the Ridley Scott classic. But we've gone for Aliens simply because it's frightening and totally hilarious at the same time. It's macho turn up to 11. Definitely. <laughs> so we're going to get the movie underway. We're just going to chat as we normally do through the film and um, enjoy. That's it. The old 20th century fox. Every time though, I'm just waiting for that. Ding. You're for the Star Wars music to kick in, aren't you? Most definitely. Except, of course, when you're the Havadian. I think that's the big thing, isn't it? Doesn't matter what movie you go and see, the intro, whether it be Universal, 20th Century Fox, whatever it is, you know once that comes up, be prepared. Yeah. So it's quite good because I mean, aliens for me. I don't really count alien because I think to me, alien is a standalone film. Be because I mean, it was the suspense and the terror of that film was brilliant. For me, this is a step up because obviously it's got more action in it. Yeah. And it's got um, a lot for me is the fact that you've got guys who think they are prepared to take on anything in the world, anything in space, whatever it is, being totally wrong. That this is a a war film in space. I mean, if you look at the people involved in it, both now and uh, at the time, you've got the director, Walter Hill, who was one of the writers, Galen Hurd, who is also the producer of The Walking Dead. Before you even get to James Cameron, and then you get to Sigourney Weaver, who is totally amazing. I mean, the picture quality, we're watching it on, um, on Blu-ray and to say this film is 28 years old, it's definitely, you definitely can't tell. I can't remember, is it set like 70 years after the first film? Is it that far? 57 years. 57. Because I did learn an interesting fact about the um, director's cut version, unfortunately. Yeah. Obviously, we've seen both versions, but in the director's cut, she finds out about her daughter. Yeah. And you've got the picture of the aged woman. Yeah. Who's her daughter. In real life, that was Sigourney Weaver's mum. Oh, was it? Yeah. That's quite clever, actually, doing that, isn't it? So this is like a... Uh, got an 87 rating on Metacritic, which is phenomenally high. It must be one of the top listed films on the IMDb as well. It's just a bit strange and sad really that when you get to Alien 3, which I kind of like and I know a lot of people don't, um, that they dispose of so many of the good characters that were left at the end of this film. Yeah. So quite easily, which is okay, it's fine, I understand you want to do your own thing, but I just, I just think it's a bit of a shame, really. But obviously you do have the um, <clears throat> fact that they were, well, it was on the table, I don't know if it still is, they were going to do a direct sequel to this, weren't they? Oh, was that, was that the original plan? Well, there is talks, or were talks, with um, Scorning Weaver, um, Michael Bain, 
to actually reprise their roles and it would discount Alien 3 and Alien 4. So it would be on a different timeline. So you said, because, I mean, at the end of the film, to wipe out in Alien 3 some of the iconic characters that you that grow through this film, it is a bit of a shame. I think so. It's the same with Alien Resurrection. There's some good things in Alien and Resurrection and there's some terrible things in Alien oh. Resurrection. Um, like the monster baby alien? The monster baby <laughs> alien just gets me every time. I just look at it and think, what on earth is going on? Why, oh, why, oh, why is that thing even there on screen? Whose idea was that? But then also you and I, when we went to go see it at the cinema when it came out, we both felt that... Um, one of the characters who's like the captain of this uh, sort of mercenary crew ship who goes out and uh, picks up things for this scientific team. You can tell he's like the coolest character in it and they kill him in like two seconds. It's just like, it's just, it's just what a waste. There we go, 80s bad guy, Paul Reiser. It's the haircut. It is. It's I'm used to it. Axel Murphy <laughs> shout name. I mean, I don't. I like the fact they've made his suit look really modern by just lifting his collar up. That's all they've done. They've probably just starched it up. Oh, there you go. It's a great way to make it feel real good. Exactly. It's like in the original film though, when John Hurt goes bye bye. It is so spectacular. And that's probably one of the things that is terrifying about the alien creature. The fact that it grows inside you. So not only will it kill you anyway, mindlessly slaughter you no matter what you're doing, it can, if you, even if you're minding your own business, it can impregnate you by a face like that, and then kill you by bursting out through your chest. That would definitely be a Bad again. grim way to go. But I'd like it in uh, Alien Resurrection when that guy is, he has got one in him, and yeah. he kills somebody by pulling their head close to his <laughs> chest, and the alien goes straight through his chest and straight through the guy's head. That is, a, that is a quality kill. But I still don't understand in some of those sequences where they're going to water. It's like, why on earth would you try and outswim an alien? He's basically built for every possible environment. It can climb walls, it's super sleek, so it's going to go through water, no problem. It definitely takes the original concept of Alien and the company behind it truly expands it. Definitely. I think that's the thing you can have <coughs> difficulty with when you're always doing a sequel is pushing out a story, yeah. building the arcs, making sure all the pieces still fit together. See, that's a bit of the naivety there, isn't it? Yeah. On 347 surveyed planets. But there's billions, trillions of planets yeah. out there. What I like as well is that the alien looks a certain way depending on the type of creature it impregnates. So it impregnates a human, it know, we know a certain look that it comes out with. And we've also seen the predator hybrid yeah. alien. And Alien 3, the two different versions, the one from the dog and the one from the... Is it like a cow type thing? Yeah, that's right. Because obviously the one from the dog is faster. Yeah, it does move really quick, doesn't it? That's the thing that's interesting about Alien 3 is the fact that they don't have any weapons other than their sort of wit and the machinery around them. Oh, that's just That's just tight. Make you feel worthless. It's actually a grim vision of the future, isn't it? Because it looks <laughs> basically like a caravan. Yeah. <laughs> in grey. With maybe a little bit of white thrown in. And I also like the fact that the coffee came from a flask. Stylish. She's got severe post traumatic stress disorder. As you'd expect. <laughs> I think if you look at this and then you look at Event Horizon, you can definitely see 
where uh, Dead Space comes from. It's definitely a hybrid of the two. All right, okay, the aliens in Dead Space are more a mutation, a virus, if you yeah. like, and they are deadly through their physical form, but they don't have the extra threat of super strong acid that can also... I mean, that's the thing I think I probably really don't like about an alien. Trying to defend yourself against one of them, you're left with literally a gun, and without one, you're screwed, and even yeah. you can't even use a gun at close range. Apparently, all these hyperpods that could only afford six, so that's a mirror at the far end to make it look like there's more. Because it costs like four thousand three hundred dollars each to make. <laughs> Straight for a cigar. <laughs> Why would Bishop be in one of those pods? Yeah, that's very true. Because I mean, well, it's a synth. Yeah, great gag coming up. <laughs> So he's gone up in the world anyway, Bill Paxton, hasn't he? Because he's now going to have a bit more screen time than he did in uh, Terminator. Does he get more screen time in this than he does in Predator 2, though? <laughs> if you wanted to wipe out the alien species, you just send Danny Glover. Yeah. Because <laughs> he was the original choice for the Terminator. Because the original idea, of course, turned out to be an infiltration unit. It goes in, it doesn't look anything spectacular. And he went and did all the sort of uh, stuff with um, James Cameron in terms of trying to get funding for the film. I think it's a shame in some respects. Don't get me wrong, obviously, they're iconic films. Iconic actors in them. And, I mean, even some of the low-budget films that have been cult, become cult classics now... It's a shame that sometimes you couldn't get to see what it would have yeah. originally looked like. I just think it's a shame in Prometheus that <laughs> the space jockey wasn't something much more interesting than rather than looking very human with the big. Yeah. Because when I watched Prometheus, I was expecting it to be basically a prequel to Alien. Yeah. But it's not, it's going to be a, a trilogy. Which to me, it spoiled it and drop so much. That's we'll <laughs> almost like a little child being scolded. Get here! In the last show, you spoke about um, these dropships being one of your favourites. It's a quality piece of kick, so obviously it can drop you through the atmosphere, so you don't have to be like land anywhere. Yeah. And it can fly normally in the atmosphere, and it can go back up to the ship, so it's quite a useful piece of kit. Yeah. I mean, it's. Obviously, it's designed. Paid tribute to in Halo? Yeah. Alright, it was copied. <laughs> the M41A <laughs> pulse rifle. Yeah. Thing is, for me, that's that's one piece. Of, it's like the motion tracker. You don't even have to see one. All you gotta do is hit the sound of either the pulse rifle or the motion tracker, and you know the movie. Oh, yeah. It's just an iconic sound. I think nowadays it's probably a little bit harder to make some of the films because obviously you do a lot of green screen, yeah, yeah. blue screen, so you've got stuff that's not there and you're trying to talk to imaginary things. I know sometimes they put actors in suits just to yeah, sort yeah. Of do it. But I bet in the 80s, early 90s, it would be quality to make one of these types of films. You just basically, it's all there. Yeah. When when an alien's coming at you, it might be somebody dressed up as one, but you, you know, you can but, get that fear. So they had 17 to 18 operators on the Alien Queen. Yeah, well, I wouldn't want to meet one of them down in Dark Alley. <laughs> it's a shame as well that Michael Bain didn't do too much 
Yeah, it sort of ended up in sort of B movie hell, yeah. and then he reappeared briefly where he dies again. I think that must be part of his contract that he gets to die in the film. In Con Air, not Con Air, mm. the Rock. The Rock. <coughs> yeah, I think that's one of the things. I mean, although he does die in uh, the Abyss as well. Yeah, dies in that. I suppose the only difference between the drop ship and the ship seeing Halo is the wingspan. But it's so narrow. I mean, I know they're supposed to be terraforming the planet, but God LV 426 is a hell of a Because if you had a guess that there was possibly something bad going down there, would you send a lieutenant who's only got two combat drops? No. But we all know there's a sacrificial team. You're right. You're not here getting a signal. You can't see anybody down there. The first thing you want really want to do is go. Right. We're going to drop Bishop off because he's expendable. <laughs> go in there. Find out if anybody's alive. If you don't see anybody, report in. We'll pick you up and then we're out of here because we're going to mute this thing. Well, I think that's what's so clever in a way about the aliens even though they've got their own shape when they're in the walls or on the ceilings they're really hard to spot yeah so you can be a million miles in space Wait, and still get a donut yeah if you're in this as well you always feel sorry for some of the cooler characters like Drake what is it 50 60 percent of them get wiped out in that one area yeah one of them's by accident, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's a a big dearth of really good sci-fi horror, wasn't there? Because you had Alien, then The Thing, then this. And this is like a really good leap forward because you think in Alien and The Thing, they've got some weapons, but they haven't really got a lot. In this, it's like, right, we're going to absolutely max you out. We're going to give you all the fun toys that you can possibly get, and you're still screwed. What you need is a pulse rifle and a train thrower. Well, that's how you survive the games. Concentrate. <laughs> Just start it. It's a tool, Lenny. <laughs> Total idiot. Cool, we've moved on from China and good mugs to plastic beakers. Because in the director's cut, the company sends, it's her mum and dad. Yeah, they, they, go, to, they go to the spaceship, don't they? It's the, what is it, what is it's it, the dad. He gets the space hook of, you know what? You're famous for town meetings, you just think of Resident Evil 4, don't you? And they'll have to wait for the church to come and uh, <laughs> ding, 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 save you before... Uh, the chainsaw guy comes in and cuts your head off. See, that's really clever because the way it's lit, it doesn't matter that it's a model because it it disguises the size. Really clever camera work. Big sci-fi action films that followed this. That I can think of, unless you can think of something else, uh, would be Total Recall. Robocop maybe, but Total Recall I would. Yeah. I know Robocop's in the near future. And I don't think I've ever seen anything as gross as Alex Murphy getting a living hell shot out of him. thing with some of these films, there's some grossness in them. Realistic sort of grossness. And I think that's what used to shock you. It's like in Robocop when Murphy gets really shot to hell. You could imagine that's what it would look like. But nowadays, when they do movies, it's just so over the top. They use CG, don't they? That's, that's yeah. part of the problem. So even something that's really cool, like John Wick, um, CGI Blood. Whereas if you watch uh, particularly the Arnie films of the late 80s, so Running Man, Predator, Total Recall, when people look like they're getting shot, they look like they're properly 
I mean, I'm sure the holes in it are, are, are underestimated in yeah. terms of what really happens, and I'm not saying I ever want to see or experience that firsthand. I mean, I suppose in a way it's a safety thing as well, because I mean, obviously, you used to have blood plaques, small explosives, and obviously, I mean, Brandon Lee got killed doing the crow. Yeah. That was a, a blank, wasn't it? That there was yeah. still something in the chamber, and that's yeah. what killed yeah. him. Wait. It's just one of the risks. This is bad leadership as well, isn't it? You take all your main dudes in there and you don't stagger them for a retreat. So you'd leave some slightly back. Then if anything kicked yeah. off, you've got you've got waves of backup. And obviously, as you said, as, as you go in, if they're running, you've got some people covering a layer as you go back. That's a lot of people. Why wouldn't you tell him why? You'd say, look, you can't shoot in there because if you pierce anything, you'll blow the place up. Yeah. See how many iconic lines from this film have been used <laughs> in so much yeah. mon modern warfare. Yeah, you've got Duke Nukem as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, decent Duke Nukem as well, not, not Duke Nukem forever. <laughs> I mean, once you see that, you know it's time to get the hell out of Dodge. There's nobody going to be alive, everybody's dead. Move, 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 and nuke it. Because to be honest with you, I can't. I mean, yeah, the company might want one. But what would you do? You know they just stay in humans. You know all the humans are gone. You might find one, two survivors down there, depending on time scale. Get them to leave. Yeah. Come back. Report. You want one? Send a bigger force down there. Don't send a force. Just nuke it. <laughs> it's done. It's clean. It's done. The planet's a rock. There's nothing worth it. Just nuke it. That's a harsh bit about a, um, him, isn't it? Because he gets burnt to a crisp. If you're going to go out, you'd prefer to go out fighting than friendly fire. Not the, well, that's a pun on a pun. Friendly fire, you can't have friendly fire, and he was burnt. So. Yeah. Alien colonial marines to be again. Now, personally for me, I know people thought it was terrible. I mean, I thought it had... At least a bit of promise. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it wasn't overly bad. It wasn't overly great. But really, with next-gen consoles, you could make an amazing alien game if you did it right. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I never. Did, did you ever play the actual alien game that was released? The one on on Xbox or PS4? No. Because it, I think some people really liked it, and some people really didn't. Sort of films as well, where. You can't really say that at the end it is really a happy ending. Yeah. Ripley once again proven she's got bigger balls than everybody else. <laughs> she's definitely one of the greatest screen heroes or heroines of all time. Oh, yeah. no danger about that. Total badass. Played with real gusto by Sigourney Weaver. Intense music. Yeah. But it's also more when you listen to it. It's more of, not like we're winning, it's more like we've got to get the hell out of here. Yeah. Oh, late on that poor sucker. Yeah. you got four Marines left who went in, plus a pilot. Yeah. And a co pilot. So that's six. In a minute, you're going to be back down to four. Yeah. And how many went in? About 14, 15. I love this bit. Oops. <laughs> you wouldn't have thought they'd have let him in, would you? No. <laughs> Get into that command centre. Lock it down. So we talked about in a previous episode autumn science fiction uh, ships. 
What about weapons? So what's, the, what, what's the weapon weapon of choice? To quote Fat Boy Slim here. Ah, oh, you see now, pulse rifle, from this. Yeah. Now one. I think is great, but it's not actually from sci-fi movie. I'm trying to think of the one with Arnie in. It's got the rail gun. Oh yeah, 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 a razor. A razor. That's the one. Yeah, the rail gun, because that's a quality piece of kit. Yeah, it is. It's a little bit hard to pick some of the weapons, because obviously, I'd say a lot of them have stolen from quite a lot of sci-fi yeah. movies over the years. What about you? Well, there's, there's the, the ultimate obvious weapon, which is the lightsaber. The, the challenge, of course, with the lightsaber is that you're more likely to cut your own arm off than you are to cut anybody else's off with it. Though it is a very, very cool weapon. Um, Chewie's Bowcaster, which is a totally epic gun. I really like a Pulse Rifle. It, it's not that far-fetched in terms of what it can do. Yet at the same time, you know that it's going to pack a punch. I love from Transformers, uh, the cartoon movie, Optimus Prime's gun, which is pretty cool. If we slightly delve from science fiction into sci-fi fantasy, I like um, the glaive because that is from uh, Krull. Because it is just it, because it, the, they are aliens that are invading. I suppose as well you could probably go down the lines of a quite like as well staff from Stargate. Oh yeah. 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 Because obviously it's a functional melee weapon, but also you've got the fact you can yeah, it's use a it blaster, blaster as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is quite cool. I quite like phases as well from Star Trek. Because obviously being solid, white, solid light weapons, they're a continuous beam. So not only can they cut stuff, but you can make them into single fire shots. They can stun... There's, they've got multiple functionality to them, which makes them pretty cool. I'm not gonna leave you now. I suppose in a way, though, I mean, when you when you think about a lot of weapons from anything, really, you could say from video games, TV, sci-fi books, they are there is very little that you can do with them because obviously they're either gonna be projectile laser you know they do pulse yeah. rail guns so they're all going to be based on a similar sort of thing so it can be quite difficult to... I mean, if you stretch out a little bit you could also start to say well you got if you bring in the guardians of the galaxy i like star lord's guns they're pretty nifty because he also tends to punch people with them at the same time yeah. And then you've got the, the different sort of weapon that, that Rocket will make throughout the movie. And then you sort of bring in, well, does that include the Infinity Gauntlet? Which potentially could wipe out the entire universe. Then do you include Molnir? Yes. Because even though yeah. it doesn't look like it's technologically advanced, it is technologically advanced in a yeah. very different way. But So whether you want to include that type of thing in a in a list or not. Let's see what we can find. Let's see what the things that we may not have remembered. <laughs> I'm blaming my old age. Uh, I'm blaming the fact that I've seen too much stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. Um, there's probably something really obvious that we haven't thought about because then you've got the noisy cricket of course something from Men in Black that's like yeah. it doesn't look like very much that's the whole <laughs> point but it's a wicked gun do you go in for like the Ghostbusters proton packs because I mean they they got different capabilities so IGN have done the coolest sci-fi movie weapons they've done 25 so They've included the Alpha Omega bomb from beneath the planet of the apes, which, okay, that's just mass. Death Race 2000's hand grenade, which I think is like a hand that is also a grenade. 
the sole satellite from Akira. This is one I know you've seen. I've not seen it. But the gristle gun from Existence. Yeah. Fires teeth. Yeah, it's a bit... That film is very weird. <laughs> Sonic Shotgun from Minority Report. It's interesting, but it's one of those, from my point of view, I'd rather have a shotgun <laughs> than a Sonic shotgun. How is this not in the top ten? The mini nuke from Starship Troopers. A mini nuke. Just mentioned it, the noisy cricket from Men in Black. Head bomb from Total Recall. That's very cool. Two weeks. <laughs> Two weeks. Uh, seismic charge, that's from... Uh, Star Wars Episode 2. The Identity Discs in Tron. They're pretty cool. Yeah. That's in at 16. The Looker Gun. I don't know what the, from the film Looker. I don't know, it's in 1981. The Molecular Wire in Johnny Mnemonic. Yeah, that's that's interesting, but for me, that's that's you got to be close to use that. Yeah. Robocop's Auto 9. That is very cool. And as we mentioned before, the proton pack from Ghostbusters. How long? Because he's holding a thermal detonator <laughs> in an eleven. <laughs> Not that we ever know what thermal is. Of course, Deckard's gun from Blade Runner. Phaser from Star Trek, which we've mentioned. The smart disc from Predator Two. It's very good, but obviously it just depends if the shoulder cannon is going to be being there. It, sh it should be, because yeah. it's much more. Because, if I mean, it depends which you go by. Cause, I mean, if you go Predator, Predator 2, if you go to Alien versus Predator Requiem, yeah. when he loses his shoulder cannon, he can actually turn it into a handgun. Oh, yeah, yeah, he does, doesn't he, yeah. So... You say it's got dual functionality. Next one up is the Genesis device in Star Trek. Then the pulse rifle. That's at number six. The Death Star. Yeah, but you can't really carry that around in your pocket, can you? No. The weirding module in Doom, which I don't really know much about. Uh, the art gun from District 9. That's a cool gun. The Glaive is at number two. The Glaive from Krull and at number one, the lightsaber. The Glaive is wicked. It is a wicked weapon. It doesn't, it, it, it looks cool. I think that's the thing as and well. And you can just kind of like use the force and put your hand out there and it just keeps spinning and attacking the enemy. When you actually think about it, which is quite cool, if you, like you said, was it Predator's light disc? Yeah. Not far dissimilar from the glaive in a way. No, it's not got at all. Hand blade type thing. So I think it's the fact that you can use that disc either in close combat because you can use it in your fingers and you can punch yeah. people with it as well as throwing. Because that's the bit where Gary Boozy gets cut in half with one of them, <laughs> isn't it? With a digital readout, show me magazine, how many bullets you've got in your magazine. I mean, if you think about this in terms of, uh, if you think about amazing alien games, I mean, we spoke about the recent one, which neither of us have really played, and you and you touched on Colonial Marines. Is there any games that you can think of that are really, really cool from a either alien or, or likewise? We've mentioned Dead Space before, but anything else that you can think of? Across so many platforms nowadays, isn't it? You could say Alien 3 on the Meg Drive snares. That was quite cool. That was a good game. That was a good game. The one you've been playing, Doom. BFG. Yeah. Do you really need a BFG when you've got a chainsaw you can carry around? Uh. <laughs> Close quarters combat. You do, say, some quality sci-fi games and you want some quality futuristic guns. Yeah. There's one that beats everything. And that's the dubstep gun. Oh, yes. Yes. Finally get to mention Saints Row. The dubstep gun is genius. It's stupidly hilarious. 
But I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you got um, Saints Row that came up with some quality stuff. I mean, you've got if you think you've got Borderlands, which is brilliant in generating different types of weapons. You had oh, what was? Of course, why have we not mentioned it? Chainsaw gun from Gears of War. That is a quality, quality, futuristic weapon. But mind you, they had quite a few great ones in that. I mean, the boom shot. Yeah, boom shot was great. Um, talk bow. But I know that's one of your personal favourite weapons. Yeah. You can hit them and kill them. And even if you miss, chances are the explosion would get them. But I suppose as well, I mean, you've got the DMR from Halo. Obviously you've got the carbine as well. Yeah, the carbine. I mean, the, a lot of the weapons in Halo are pretty good. I mean, if you're playing the original Halo, all you then need is your handgun, which you can probably get through the entire game with a handgun because it's so ridiculously powerful. Then you've got, I like the, the multi-tool that you've got in Dead Space, which is really cool. The fact that you can change angle with it to take out uh, the creatures in it well because that's the one that flips to horizontal and vertical isn't it yeah yeah that's because i think that's what's quite good about dead space is it's sort of moved away from the obvious i.e look you've got a little spot here shoot shoot the creature there you'll get away with it you'll kill it or just keep pummeling rounds into it until it's dead now you can do that in dead space, but obviously you can look at it and go. I guess if you include Metroid, then it's the suit. Yeah. Which is really cool. And you've got games now like you've got Overwatch, you've got Battleborn, and things like that. For me, I think now developers are getting quite clever because they look at it and go. Right, you've got sniper class, so you've got long range classes, heavy, assault, and assist, and each one has got a weapon specifically designed for its capability, Yeah. which you're not going to bother to, I mean, so you're not going to give a medic a massive machine gun because obviously they're going to be too overpowered so you've got to be careful on how you utilise each of your things I mean play Evolve that's got some quality things in it but then obviously also if you're going to go down the total awesomeness of weapons in games you, you can't really go just into the sci-fi section you've got to go into Dead Rising territory. Oh, yeah. we can make whatever weapon you like. I mean, that's the thing. That's the clever thing. I mean, what? The hammer that electrifies things? Well, the best of all is, and I'm sure everybody wants to try this, you put a jewel in a torch, it becomes a lightsaber. But the other game that we haven't really spoken about, which is probably as epic a sci-fi game as you're ever going to experience, is Mass Effect. I mean, Mass Effect 2 in particular is yeah. one of the best games ever. Without a shadow of a doubt. It's just phenomenally good. It works on multiple levels. And it caters, <clears throat> from my point of view, it caters for your play style. If you wanted to be a sniper, you can be a good sniper. You can pick a good sniper rifle. So, if you want to be a salt, you can be a salt class. You don't have to pick up a weapon and be good with that class. I mean, that's where some games do let you down a little bit. If you're not particularly good with certain weapons, you can't play certain games because that's what you're told. You've got to use that. That's it. Yeah. Would you want to be the one who goes up to look in the ceiling? Or would you prefer to be the one that goes, uh, let's go out that door that's out the back? So I think this is, in a way, a little bit where Dead Space got some of its 
air duct suspense from because sometimes when you're crawling through them air ducts you just do not know what's coming no Hudson and Vasquez who were there and it's not as her and the lieutenant but yeah Gorman I mean he's he's still a tool so it's quite interesting actually it doesn't kill her no it takes her this hunger needs a living yeah, to survive, yeah. <clears throat> to create a new alien. <laughs> There's nothing quite like the quality wonders of duct tape to take two weapons together. So I miss Mr. I could have sworn he used his shotgun to kill the alien that trapped that um, burnt through his arm. And... No, I think I think he um, I think the shotgun gets written off. He says, "Eat this," and he puts it in his mouth because when you see him pull it out, it's all sort of smoking. What I quite like about aliens as well, when you think about it, we were talking earlier about how you make a sequel different from the original and keep the concept fresh. Yeah but the same in some respects. When you look at it, I mean, you've got Predator, Aliens, Star Wars, Star Trek, both movies and TV series. Yeah. You can class Stargate because they made a 10 season TV series and then they made Stargate Atlantis and Stargate Universe which didn't do too well but you have basically created not just a story but an entire universe I mean it is like the Marvel comics and the DC yeah, comics yeah. you're still creating an interlinked universe of hundreds of thousands of potential characters and stories <laughs> Now another great bit in the movie. You just run away from an explosion to find yourself in the middle of the nest. She is one big angry looking lady. That's a big pair of teeth. H.R. Geiger had a really crazy mind to come up with these things. Totally, totally crazy. I think it's but that's probably the one thing that the alien truly fears as well isn't it fire. fire yeah I mean when you look at it as well I mean the design I mean it's very simple in a way I mean it's not overly elaborate in any way it's got a tail it's got claws teeth it's just a killing yeah. machine no eyes yeah, there's a rebox so it's one of those things where you look at it and think it's made terrifying by its simplicity. Oh, you'd surely be switching to grenades right now. Definitely. <laughs> if we were playing the game. <laughs> if we were playing the game, mate, and it was co-op, you'd be at your front with your <laughs> sub rifle blasting away and I'd be at the back with a sniper rifle taking pot shots. I kind of feel sorry for the alien queen. She's just kind of minding her own business, just laying some eggs. It's not her fault. <laughs> there you are, Ripley coming in here. What's cool about this is that she goes it alone. It's not like she needs the Marines to help her. Yeah. I mean, I know, <laughs> other than Hicks, they're all dead. Bishop could have gone. Yeah. Because, in a way, he's not supposed to harm any human life. So um, he could... He's probably less of a threat to the alien as yeah. well. Because there's nothing for them to impregnate. Oh, could they? I don't know. Probably not, because obviously I should imagine it gets some of it, because it, like we said, it gets its attributes from the host. It would probably do that through the DNA. Yeah. I'm sure some uh, crazy people have done some form of time fiction involved in an alien. <laughs> About. The secret as well with Bishop is uh, Lance Henriksen actually has, I think it's 
two weak old milk the, and he had to hold it in and keep puking it out because it's the only thing they could get it to make it thick enough <laughs> oh nice god I feel sorry for bishop haven't you Oh, yeah. He went outside, but it was all dangerous, did that for ages, and then he gets killed on board his own ship. Or he didn't get killed, does he? Just gets ripped in, but ripped in half. Get away from her, you bitch! That's said with proper venom as well, isn't it? <coughs> do you reckon they do that in the classes? Right, this is how you use it for loading, this yeah. is how you use it for a smackdown. Yeah. Oh, now the question is, would you be able to be a real steel fighting robot <laughs> with the loader? <laughs> You'd have to be really careful. So she's got a strength advantage in that, lo in that loader, but it's speed that she's lacking. It's kind of lucky as well that that didn't like break the alien's skin. And it's quite lucky that she actually landed on top of it. Yeah. So I quite like as well, which you, you've noticed, it's actually snapped the end of the tail off. The point. It's gone, is it's, it? Yeah, it's gone. It's got snapped off. You would have thought that that would have ripped her arm off. With the queen holding on to her. See, now she's got to buy a new pair of Reeboks. So. <laughs> so, aliens, rating out of 10. Going to give it a 9. Yeah. The only reason gets a 9, for me, it's definitely a classic. I think it's brilliant film but I think a little, a little bit of the dialogue you know don't get me wrong love Hudson's character but he does keep repeating the same stuff over and over which can get a bit annoying plus um, for me obviously I think the director's cut is a bit better because when you look at a few bits in the theatrical version they don't make all bits of sense if you know what I mean because yeah. you look in it's like when they've got the weapons on the table and he says right we've got this this and this but you can clearly see they've got other weapons on the table as well which in the director's cut is explained yeah but no but it's a solid nine for me what about you yeah, I, I, I give it a 9 out of 10 too. I think it's um, one of the best sequels of all time. Um, and I think that it's, it's, it shows the early promise from James Cameron when he did Terminator, showing he really could take it up the next level. And then from here, of course, he then went on made the abyss and then from the abyss he went on with his new special effects that he learned on the abyss to make terminator 2 which again is one of the best sequels of all time um but i think there's just so much quality in this i think the music is spot on even though bits of it are taken from um the score that james horner did for star trek to the wrath of khan you can occasionally hear uh, little nods and notes from that but I think Sigourney Weaver is just amazing in this film. And I think it's her who's her her and her character who are as iconic as the xenomorph itself. And yeah, I think nine. Nine is nine is the right score for this film. Would I say it's better than Alien? Probably not. I think Alien for me just tops it because I believe that Alien just brought something completely different into the picture it is the haunted house in space um, done really well I think it just edges it but I, I think that this is just it is a really great film 
I think that's the thing, isn't it? Nowadays, <clears throat> a lot of the movies that we see come f- have to progress from what came before. And really and truthfully, there isn't that much that we haven't seen in the movies from the 80s. I mean, it's like you said, you've got the thing, you've got the alien, you've got the predator. At the time they came out, there was nothing really that even stood up to those sort of things. Now, when you look at it, because everybody... Sometimes I think what people do is they make mistakes as directors or screenwriters. I know they want to create an enjoyable story, but what they do is they say, right, you got Predator. I want my thing, my creature my story to be better or more scary or he's got to be more dangerous. And by doing that, you're trying to compete with something that you can't really compete with where they should turn around and go, right, I'm going to write this story. I'm going to come up with my own thing and hopefully my vision will be understood by the people that I'm not trying to be go one better yeah. or emulate it. So, uh, this particular episode, thank you, Ed, once again. You're welcome. And I'm sure we'll do something different next week. Don't know what, we'll probably decide and then we'll uh, surprise you on our next episode. We'll try and keep up with our 80s themed at the moment. Got a few ideas spinning around. We may do, as we mentioned on our thing, podcast we may pick up the John Carpenter theme and do one of his uh, was it the Darkness trilogy or something on that uh, side of before? the Apocalypse trilogy, Apocalypse trilogy. So there's, I think there's the Prince of Darkness which I've seen and In the Mouth of Madness which I haven't seen so if we can find a copy of that or uh, as I said the Prince of Darkness we'll watch that, one of them or we may go something different um, we may pick up another carpenter and may pick up something completely different. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed it and we'll speak to you soon. Bye bye.